The History of the Peloped Line The Trojan War The families of Agamemnon and Menelaus are central figures to the events of the Trojan War. The kidnapping of Helen of Sparta by Paris of Troy is the human casus belli of the Trojan War. Agamemnon rallied around him the Achaean kings in support of his brother Menelaus, and so began the ten-year conflict known as the Trojan War. The divine or Olympian casus belli is different from the excuse given by the Atreidae, and has to do with a prophecy about Zeus. Zeus was informed, some say by Themis, others by Prometheus, that one day he would be surpassed and overthrown by one of his children. Zeus had himself overthrown his father Cronos, who had likewise overthrown his father Uranus. The kidnapping of Helen of Sparta by Paris of Troy is brought about because of what is known as the Judgment of Paris, which is in itself part of a plan within a plan by Zeus. Zeus wished to stop the gods interbreeding with mortals who were becoming too numerous on the earth. He had decided to rid the world of many of the semi divine heroes and demigods that were a result of this interbreeding between gods and mortals. This, coupled with a desire to solve his oracular problem of a son who may surpass him, by killing said son, led Zeus to conceive of the Trojan War. In another version of the story, Zeus created the Trojan War so that the generation of heroes and demigods might be elevated to legendary status. How he started this war was with the wedding of Thetis and Peleus. Zeus invited all of the gods and many other guests besides, but deliberately ordered Hermes to leave the goddess Eris off the guest list. Zeus knew that this would anger Eris, and that being true to her nature, she would then cause absolute chaos amongst the guests. Eris, enraged at being excluded from the wedding, took one of the golden apples of the Hesperides and carved onto it the phrase, To the fairest. Eris then threw the apple into the wedding, where it was immediately seized and fought over by the goddesses Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite. Unable to agree as to which of them was the fairest, and therefore the recipient of the golden apple, the goddesses agreed to let a third party judge the competition. They turned to Zeus to be the arbiter of their contest, but he wisely refused to provide judgment for the three, and suggested that a mortal called Paris perform the task. The goddesses agreed to this, and Zeus had Hermes transport them to Mount Ida, where they disrobed and bathed. Hermes went ahead and announced the competition to Paris, who was tending his flocks of sheep upon the mountain. Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite then appeared naked before Paris, and asked him to choose which of the three was the most beautiful, and hence should receive the golden apple. This was known as the Judgment of Paris. Each of the goddesses offered Paris a boon for his vote. Hera offered him kingship and dominion over Europe and Asia, while Athena offered him great wisdom and prowess in battle. Finally, Aphrodite offered him the most beautiful woman in the world, namely Helen of Sparta, the wife of King Menelaus. Enamoured with Helen, Paris chose Aphrodite as the fairest, whilst at the same time earning the enmity of Hera and Athena. Paris then took ship to Sparta where he stayed at the court of King Menelaus and began to seduce Helen. When Menelaus left for a funeral in Crete, Paris saw his opportunity and took Helen and her treasure back to Troy. In some versions of the story, Helen goes willingly, in others she is abducted by Paris. To avoid detection they travelled in a roundabout way before eventually returning to Troy. So began the Trojan War, as the Greeks laid siege to the ancient city of Ilium, or Ilion, known as Troy, which is modern day Hesalic. Agamemnon commanded the United Kings of Greece, while a 15 year old Achilles commanded the Achaean fleet. The details that survive of the story can be found in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, originally part of a much larger epic known as the Cypriad, as well as in Apollodorus's library of Greek mythology, numerous Greek and Roman plays, as well as in some other literary fragments. 
The Achaean kings assembled their fleet at the port of Aulis in Boeotia. Agamemnon had offended the goddess Artemis. Not only did he kill one of her sacred deer during a hunt, he also compounded his mistake by claiming to be a greater hunter than the goddess herself. Artemis in return caused the winds and the sea to be still, leaving the Greek war fleet of a thousand ships becalmed in the harbour. The prophet and seer Calchas, who was an ornithomancer, determined that the fleet would remain becalmed until Agamemnon sacrificed his most beautiful daughter. The victim was to be his child, Iphigenia. To fulfil the prophecy of the oracular vision, Agamemnon sent Odysseus and Talthybius to his wife Clytemnestra. They told her that Iphigenia was to be married to Achilles as a reward for his actions in the war. Iphigenia was therefore brought to Aulis under the false pretense of being married to Achilles. She was then sacrificed to the goddess Artemis by her father Agamemnon. In some versions of the story, Iphigenia was spirited away by the goddess Artemis to Taurus, whilst a magical deer was substituted for the child. Agamemnon's actions caused numerous problems during the Trojan War. His refusal to ransom or return the captured priestess Chryseis to her father Chryses caused the god Apollo to inflict a plague upon the Greeks. When Agamemnon returned Chryseis, he then demanded compensation and seized the girl Briseis from Achilles. This insult was the cause of the dispute between Achilles and Agamemnon, Achilles' subsequent anger and the events that follow being the subject of Homer's Iliad. After the war, Agamemnon returned home to Mycenae accompanied by his claimed concubine Cassandra. Cassandra was the daughter of King Priam of Troy and his wife Hecuba, and was a priestess of Apollo. Cassandra had been cursed by Apollo, who had given her the gift of prescience. The gift of prescience had been part of Apollo's amorous advances towards Cassandra, but after receiving this gift, she went back upon her word to the god and spurned his advances. Unable to rescind a divine gift, Apollo cursed Cassandra that she would always correctly predict the truth, only no one would ever believe her. The only time when Cassandra was actually believed was when she recognised her long lost brother Paris, whose return actually revealed to her the forthcoming destruction of the city of Troy. Treachery and murder awaited Agamemnon and Cassandra when they returned to Mycenae after the war. Cassandra was aware of this, foreseeing their deaths, but as usual was not believed. Aegisthus, the son of Thyestes and slayer of Atreus, awaited them, determined to pursue his vendetta against the sons of Atreus. Zeus had sent Hermes to warn Aegisthus to abandon his vendetta, for if he did not, it would result in his death by the hands of Orestes, the son of Agamemnon. Aegisthus, however, decided to ignore the warning. Aegisthus had contrived excuses to avoid going to the Trojan War and had instead travelled to Mycenae, where he seduced Clytemnestra. Clytemnestra, Agamemnon's wife, also desired revenge against her husband for the sacrifice of their daughter Iphigenia, as well as Agamemnon's slaughter of her newborn children by her previous husband, Tantalus. Clytemnestra first tricked Agamemnon into walking upon a purple carpet barefoot, an act of great hubris which was suggestive of the king taking on the airs and graces of a god. He was then led into the bathhouse of his palace and encouraged to bathe. In one version of the story, Agamemnon is given a tunic that is like a net, with no neck or sleeves, and is murdered as he is entangled when putting it on. In another, as he steps out of the bath, with one foot in and one foot without, a mighty net was cast upon Agamemnon, ensnaring him. In some versions of the story, Agamemnon is killed by Aegisthus, who strikes him twice wielding the double-edged sword of Thyestes which had been given to him by his mother Pelopea. In some accounts it is Clytemnestra who slays Agamemnon, this time with a double-headed axe, or Labrys. There are also numerous versions of the story where it is both who slay Agamemnon together. 
Cassandra is also then murdered by Clytemnestra, along with her twin children by Agamemnon, and her head is cast upon the street. Clytemnestra announces her justification for these murders, revenge for her daughter Iphigenia, who was sacrificed by her husband at Aulis. Aegisthus then becomes the ruler of Mycenae, with Clytemnestra by his side as his queen. Orestes Orestes, the young son of Agamemnon and Clytemnestra, fled the city following these actions, helped by his sister Electra. She spirited Orestes away, and entrusted him to Strophius the Phoxian, who raised him with his own son Pylades. When he reached manhood, Orestes desired to know whether or not he should take revenge upon his father's murderers, and so sought out the counsel of the oracle at Delphi. Orestes was granted authority to take revenge by Apollo and set out to Mycenae, accompanied by Pylades. Upon reuniting with his sister Electra at the grave of Agamemnon, they concocted a plan to kill Aegisthus and Clytemnestra. Orestes killed Aegisthus, but hesitated when it came to killing his mother. Pylades, however, reminded his friend of the authority and will of the god Apollo in the matter, causing Orestes to strike his mother down. Because he had committed matricide, Orestes was pursued by the Erenyes, or Furies, and driven to madness by them. Orestes, temporarily aided by Apollo and Hermes, escaped to Athens, where Athena put him on trial for the murder of Clytemnestra and Aegisthus. In some versions of the story, he is indicted by the Furies in their divine role as extractors of familial revenge. In others, the trial is brought about by Erigone, the daughter of Clytemnestra and Aegisthus. The trial was held upon the Acropolis of Athens, with the jury being made up of twelve Athenians and presided over by Athena herself. The verdict was tied, and the goddess Athena gave the casting vote in favour of Orestes. The Furies were initially not happy with the verdict, but Athena persuaded them otherwise, before determining that such disputes would be settled under trial in court from then on. The goddess Athena then turned the Arrhenes into the Eumenides, or the kindly ones. Most of this narrative is retold in Aeschylus's trilogy of plays, known as the Oresteia, which include Agamemnon, Coephorae, or the Libation Bearers, and Eumenides, or the Kindly Ones. In other source material, the story continued, with Orestes and Pylades travelling to Taurus where they sought out a statue of the goddess Artemis. They were sent on this quest by Apollo as a way of appeasing the Furies, and their goal was to return this statue of Artemis to Athens. The people of Taurus were part of the Scythian race, and sacrificed all Greeks to the goddess Artemis. Orestes and Pylades were soon captured and taken before King Thoas, who ordered the two to be presented for sacrifice. The priestess of Artemis at Taurus happened to be Orestes' sister, Iphigenia, whom all believed had been sacrificed by Agamemnon at Aulis in order to launch the fleet of a thousand ships. As you will recall, there are versions of the myth where Iphigenia was saved at the point of sacrifice by the goddess Artemis. At Aulis, the goddess swapped the girl with a sacred deer that resembled her and spirited Iphigenia away to Taurus and safety. Iphigenia promised to spare Orestes and Pylades if they would deliver a letter for her, which ultimately led to brother and sister recognising each other. The three then fled from Taurus and returned to Athens together with the statue of Artemis, which is now known as the Tauropolis statue. Brothers and sisters were reunited, and the famous family curse was finally lifted. Supposedly. Tisamenus Orestes went on to kill Alite, the son of Aegisthus and Clytemnestra, who had taken control of Mycenae. Orestes married Hermione, his cousin, by whom he had a son called Tisemenus, and his companion Pylades married Electra. Orestes himself is said to have died from snakebite and was the subject of worship in hero cults. Tisemenus, the son of Orestes and Hermione, became the king of Sparta, Argos, and Mycenae before being overthrown and killed by the Heraclids, who sought to retake the Peloponnese. With the death of Tisemenus, 
the kingdoms were divided amongst the sons of Heracles, and the rule of the Pelopid line came to an end. Menelaus and Helen After leaving Troy, Menelaus, the brother of Agamemnon, encountered a devastating storm which destroyed much of his fleet and killed many of his men. After being driven away from Attica, his ships sailed along the coasts of Libya, Phoenicia and Cyprus, until he eventually arrived in Egypt with only five ships remaining. Here it is said that at the court of King Proteus of Egypt, Menelaus discovered his wife Helen. She had been spirited away by Hermes under orders from Zeus, and the Helen who accompanied Paris from Troy was actually a doppelganger forged from clouds. Reunited with the real Helen, Menelaus eventually returned to Mycenae where he met Orestes avenging his father's murder. He then travelled home to Sparta and retook his own kingdom. It was said that Hera made Menelaus immortal and that he and Helen now reside together in the Elysian fields. There are many elements of the Peloped story overlaid onto the narrative of Frank Herbert's Dune series. Frank Herbert's use of mythology, especially by mythographers such as Lord Raglan and Joseph Campbell, maintains a systemic and reiterative approach to his heroic narrative. Paul and Leto II go through many of the ritualistic steps of these systems, which arguably follow the Agonorid line of Thebes and the Oedipus myth, as it is the basis for Raglan's ritualistic steps. These steps are at best just placeholders in a story designed to be universal, that is, a monomyth. It is the cyclical and spiral natures of the stories of the Pelopid line that Frank Herbert uses to demonstrate again and again the dangers of both heroes and prescience. Now that you know the story of the Pelopids and the curse of the House of Atreus, I will leave you with something from Dune. In this scene, which mirrors Agamemnon's sacrifice of Iphigenia, Paul is unable to act prior to the final battle, until... My son is dead, Paul said, and knew as he spoke that it was true. My son is dead, and Alia is a captive hostage. He felt emptied, a shell without emotions. Everything he touched brought death and grief, and it was like a disease that could spread across the universe. He could feel the old man wisdom, the accumulation out of the experiences from countless possible lives. Something seemed to chuckle and rub its hands within him. And Paul thought, how little the universe knows about the nature of real cruelty. Hi everyone, I'm Doc Sloan and I'd like to thank you for watching my science fiction station. We'd love to hear your comments and feedback on our videos. If you enjoy the content, please give it a like, and if you're a bit of a fan of science fiction, we'd appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel and spread the word. Thanks very much, bye bye.